There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head Bring the rain Morning. Morning. It's great to be with you, real privilege to be able to share and uh, open up something from the Word of God this morning. This morning we're going to be continuing on in the, the book of Hebrews. Tiva has been taking us through that. And uh, we're going to continue a little in the book of Hebrews this morning. He's been calling us to uh, the, the Word of God and all the wonderful things that God's Word is to us and for us. It's power and uh, its ability to work in our lives. And uh, so as we come to God's Word, I just want to read from Psalm 19 just to remind us of the Word of God. Uh, just the latter half from verse 7 on. And just as we read, you don't need to look up, but just as we read, just say, Lord, let this be your word to me, even this morning. The Lord Jesus reminds us what has been said in the Old Testament. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In Psalm 19, we read these words. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Father, we worship in your presence this morning. We are so grateful for the gift of your word. And yet we know that it's not just black words printed on white paper or whatever it is, a, an app in a phone. When we come to your word in faith, we meet with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word of God. So we worship in your presence and we say we want more of you. As we open up your word, meet with us. Father, we don't need men. We need you, Jesus. Yeah. But we thank you that your word of promise is this. That when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Hallelujah. You are a great and wonderful God. And we bless your name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Just, you're good. Had a good week. And I know some of us will. Some of us won't. Uh, we come from many and mixed backgrounds, don't we? Um... But the Lord will bless us as we fix our hearts and our eyes on him. Tiba was looking last in chapter 4 of Hebrews and verses uh, 12 and uh, leading into 13. I'm going to go back there a little bit this morning in Hebrews 4 and then move on into the next paragraph as well. Just to remind us of, of the book of Hebrews and uh, the challenge that it brings to us. And one of the surprises to me looking into Hebrews and studying it is... All my life I've known about Hebrews is this book is the better than. Jesus is the better than. Better than the prophets, better than the angels, better than Moses, better than the old covenant. He completes, he fulfills. And, uh, and I've always understood that. But to go a little bit deeper and press into it more, to realise that he gives us this presentation of Jesus as an exhortation to live full tilt for God in a world that is anti-God. It's, an, it's not just a teaching book, you know. When I was a kid learning to read, uh, I had this book called Tip and Run. It was about this dog called Tip. Come here, Tip. Stay there, Tip. You know, it wasn't written as a great work of literature. It was written to help me to learn to read. And I'm thankful for that. You know, some books are just written as a textbook. The book of Hebrews is not a textbook about how Jesus is better than the Old Covenant. It's an exhortation for a people coming under severe persecution to say, whatever's in the world, it's nothing compared with the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and all that he's got for you. Yeah. And we may not be in the same circumstance as the people that they're facing because the government had outlawed Christianity. We're not in that circumstance today. I believe the temptations, the struggle that we're facing is radically different. Where they were facing persecution, we are facing apathy. Yeah. Society is apathetic towards the church. And we have a different challenge. They ignore us. And some of the things that have been coming out of the book of Hebrews I've been looking at, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we're not facing the things they were facing because 
Maybe I'm not living like they were living. Maybe if I was living like they were living, I would take the notice of the government and the government would start legislating against me. Maybe this is a challenge for me to start living a bit more radical as a Christian and full tilt so that society will sit up and take note of the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is filled with the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How can the world ignore that? How? Maybe it's because I don't manifest him. I don't show him. I don't live him. And so we come to this word of grace because I'm thankful that God is a God who loves us. And is a God who's patient and long-suffering with us. But we look at the exhortations. They're really strong exhortations in this book. Chapter 2, verse 3. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. Oh, I forgot the right one there. Yeah. Oh, yes. Verse 3. He says, how shall we escape? If we ignore so great a salvation, how shall we? I mean, that's not sort of usual Sunday church follower, is it? How should we ignore? How should we escape if we ignore the salvation? Chapter three and verse twelve, he says, "Take care, brothers." He's talking to Christians, lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. It's an exhortation. Don't fall away. Chapter ten. In 32 and around those verses, we find that they'd already been suffering for their faith. They'd already had conf confiscated their property. Their property had already been taken away. And we know that they'd been imprisoned. And as we read on, we find that also there's a threat to life. I think if we're reading to chapter 12, it says, You've not yet suffered to the point of shedding your blood. And so he's, in, he's speaking into a context to a group of people who, for living the Christian life, was a real threat upon their comfort and their ease and their, their a challenge to the way they This is why the book's written. Because these Jews who became Christians, accepted Jesus as their Messiah, they were being tempted to go back into Judaism. Once over, when the Christianity first started, the Roman Empire saw it as part of the Jewish religion. I said, and the Jewish religion was a legal religion in the Roman Empire. But then there came a point where Nero, the emperor, separated it off and said, no longer, no way. He wanted somebody, I think, to blame for the fire of Rome. So he blamed it. And from that point on, Christianity was seen as a distinct religion, and it was not legal, so it was persecuted. The temptation to sit back into anonymity, to step back into ease. If I step back into Judaism, it'll be easy. I won't be persecuted. I won't be threatened. I won't be in fear of my life being killed. See, that's the same thing that we're called challenged with, I think. Not the threat upon our lives, but the step into ease. The step into anonymity. So that I don't stick my head above the parapet. And this is where the book of Hebrews is a real challenge to us. And our everyday Christianity and our lives. The people in Hebrews hadn't yet learned the lesson that the disciples had learned in, at the end of John chapter 6. You remember John chapter 6 when Jesus performs the miracle of feeding the 5,000 and then they follow him and Jesus says, you guys just follow me because you get your bellies full, which I quite like really. But he says, that's not the reason to follow me. And he goes on to talk about, if you want to follow me, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You've got to be so identified with me, so identified with the whole of my life. And they began to drift away. It's a hard saying. Who can accept it? And he was just left with the 12 and he says, will you also go and what does Peter say? You've got the words of eternal life. Yeah. Where else can we go? We could say Peter's words like this. You've got the words of eternal life. There is nowhere else to go. Once you've acknowledged that somebody's got eternal life within them, what's left? Where else is the to go? And yet that's what these Hebrews have been tempted, and some of them were doing. They were stepping away from Jesus back into Old Covenant religion. They were stepping away from the only hope. They hadn't learned that lesson that the disciples said, there's nowhere to go, Lord. They hadn't learned the lesson that those in Revelation 12, and it says of them, well, let's just turn to Revelation 12 and read that a little bit. It says in verse 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down. Amen? Yeah. 
the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. You heard that as Dan's brought that word about accusations ceasing. He's defeated. He accuses them day and night before God. And he says this, and they have conquered him. He accuses them, but they have conquered him. How? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Three things to defeat the enemy. The word of your testimony, the blood of the Lamb, and don't love your life unto death. And they defeated Satan because of that. And the Hebrews were stepping back from loving their lives unto death. They were stepping into comfort. And so the book of Hebrews is a real challenge for us uh, as we read it. And so just into the text that we're in today, into uh, chapter 4. And uh, verses 11 to, to 13 and 14 to the end of the chapter. We're just going to look at it. There's a, there's a real challenge comes. Steve was bringing out to us the power of God's word. And I absolutely love that. As a preacher, I have prayed these words over sermons many, many times. The word of God is living and active. Loved it and prayed it. Um, but we're going to look at that. And that's a serious challenge for us. It's intended to cement our resolve. But then just going into a little bit after that about the high priest. That becomes a great provision for us, providing for us everything that we need. So this serious challenge from verse 11, he says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. I wonder if you've missed, I can't help what you missed on the news this week. The big, one of the big news stories, besides President Trump doing all these silly things, is uh, a rocket that took off, was it 50 years ago? Anybody actually missed that one? It was everywhere. And there's these massive rockets on the launch pad, and three guys in this little pod at the top, and I don't know how many thousands of pounds worth of thrust there was in that rocket. Is it a Saturn V rocket? Is that what they called it? And it launched them into space. Incredible power. You know, when they lit that rocket, it wasn't a little guy and said, light the blue touch paper with your taper and run like mad. No, it wasn't one of those. Uh, you know, it was all done automatically. But that thrust, and you expect, once that rocket's engines were lit, you expected that that rocket was going to go into the sky. What would have happened then? What would you think if that rocket was lit? All that power, all those flames, that smoke, that cloud, that thrust, and the rocket stayed absolutely where it was. It wouldn't happen, would it? But imagine that it would. You're thinking something is wrong here. Something desperate. Though. There's a power being released, but there's no movement. There's a force being released, but there's no change. There's no mission. And as we come to this section of the Word of God, that's, that's what the writer is trying to encourage them. Don't fall away. He's encouraging them to enter the rest. The rest isn't passivity, as Stephen explained to us. Rest is salvation. Rest is God rested on the seventh day. You step into God's provision of everything so that your heart is at peace. Strive to enter that rest. I think he's strive to enter rest, as Stephen brought out for us. But well, we've got to have a mindset that says, I'm not going to let anything rob me of living in the Father's seventh day. That's what striving means. Having a mindset that whatever comes my way, I'm going to live in seventh day rest. Because the Father has won that for me. So that's the striving. But then, in this section on the Word of God, he says to you, you know like a rocket on the launch pad that exhausts its engines? It's got to go somewhere. He says, the Word of God is powerful. It's got to have that effect in your life. There's something wrong if you receive the word of God, but it doesn't have effect. It doesn't, it's got to, because it is the power. It's quicker, it's sharper, it's, it's powerful and effective. Amen. And here's the challenge, how effective is the word of God in my life? Amen. We've got to choose its effect. It is a challenge because you look at the end of these verses, verse 13, we know it's a challenge. It says, no creature is hidden from his sight. Everything is naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, you may, it's a serious thing, isn't it, to fall away from Christ. And that's why this is a serious teaching. 
Because he's saying, don't do it. If you leave Christ, you've got nothing. And so he challenges them very seriously. We're going to have to give an account. You've got this, you think a rocket's powerful? This is the word of God. He said, let there be light. And there was light. You read, read later on in Hebrews 11, it says, God created the world out of nothing. And it's that same creative word that is available in your heart. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. It's that same creative word that's available in our lives. When God said, let there be light, it's that same word in our hearts. And so you know God is good. God is fair. God is just. But when he sows his life, when he sows his energy, he expects there to be a result. Yeah. It's just his, He says, let there be light. You know, first day of creation. Let there be light and nothing is not going to happen, is it? Because when God speaks, it happens. Yes. So when God's word is sown in our lives, the challenge is, are we ready to give God the harvest of the power that has been sown in us? Because there is an accounting. Scary? Yeah, it's meant to challenge us. It's meant to move us. Yeah. It's a challenge that steadies our resolve. Yeah. It stops us from stepping back into the world. Mm. Interesting, the word account there is the same word, word. For God's word is living and active, is logos, and we are going to have to give a word. We're going to have to give a logos. If I speak too loud, please just let me know. <laughs> so in response to God's word, we are going to have to speak a word. According to what we've done with what he's given to us. I wonder if in these words there is, in the writer's mind, some sort of reflection on the world that they are facing. The word of God is living out to sharper than any double-edged sword. It's sharper than a sword. It's not just like a sword, it's way sharper than a sword. And uh, I wonder if they, he's thinking about the persecution that they may be facing from the Roman Empire. What did the Roman soldiers carry with them day by day, carried on their belt? They saw that he had a sword. But he says, you're giving in to this temptation to deny Christ. Why? Because of the threat of the Roman Empire. Because of the threat of Rome. They've got swords on their belt that are sharp, yeah. But the word of God is sharper still than that. Amen. Don't give in to that. They've got power. The word of God's got much more power. Why are you yielding to the power that you can see? Is it because it's more real to than you, the power that you can't see? Friends, be assured the power you can't see is the one that's going to last. There's one that's going to come. Don't yield to what you can see. Yield to what you cannot see. That's, right. nice. That's the challenge that he's there for. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. Powerful to dividing a certain spirit. Soul and marrow. And Tiva brought that out for us. And then he goes on in 13 to say, No creature is hidden from his sight. You may be able to duck the Roman Empire's gaze by slipping back into the synagogue. By slipping back into your Jewish religion. You may duck Emperor Nero. You may escape the Roman soldiers. No one can escape the searching sight of God. Yeah. You cannot escape Him. You've got to give an account. You've got to respond to these words. All are naked and exposed. Completely naked before God. We can't hide a thing. We may be able to hide stuff from each other. Uh, but we cannot hide anything from Him. And this word exposed is an interesting little word. It's, it's a word that maybe a wrestler would use in a wrestling hole that would stretch an opponent over his back and pull his head back, exposing the neck. So that the very vulnerable position, so that the neck is exposed, maybe for a, a final blow. We are naked and exposed. We are completely transparent and helpless before the judgment of God. And he says, what are you doing with this powerful word? You've been given this better than a rocket on a launch pad. You've been given this awesome power in your heart and in your life. God looks for it to have an effect. He looks for it to have an effect. Because you're going to be held to an account one day. Now for the Christian, we have no fear when we're held to account. Because as regards our sin, the Lord Jesus has taken all that away. But regarding our ministry in the kingdom of God, there is an accounting. He is going to weigh us up. 
And he's saying there's no need for us to fail because when God speaks a word, it accomplishes what it's set to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And so there's no reason for us to fail because this powerful creation world is at work within us. Amen? Amen. Do we see that challenge? I trust we receive it in the spirit that it's meant. It's meant to save us from, from, from being uh, in, unproductive. meant to save us from stepping out of the limelight. It's meant to save us from hiding away. It's meant to thrust us and encourage us and, and call us into that place of fruitfulness yeah. no matter what the cost. The powerful word of God that is at work within us. It's a strong word. And, and it, remember, it was written to people who were being tempted to deny Jesus. Tempted to give up on Jesus. And sometimes we've got to remember that. We take the challenge. But I don't know whether many people were being tempted to give up on Jesus as they came in this morning. And so we receive it at the level we need. It's maybe not, I'm not going to give up on Jesus. But in my workplace, have I just hid my light a little bit yeah. for fear? Yeah. Yeah. And in other places, in my home maybe. Wherever I'm facing, am I ducking out of the full consequence of living for him? This word tells me he's given me everything needed, all the power. And then moving on then. So that's a, a challenge that's meant to cement our resolve. Moving on, we've got this great provision giving us all the strength we need. Verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Yeah. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So he's brought a big challenge, but now he brings out a great comforting promise for us. Let us hold fast. Let us draw near. We work this. We hold fast by drawing near. We hold fast by drawing near. He says, let us hold fast the word of our confession. And that's vitally important for them. Because if they were going to, according to the preacher, the Bible teacher, David Borson, I was listening to him, he said that if they were going to leave Christianity and step back into the synagogue, ducking the empire's gaze, they will be required to deny that Jesus was the Messiah as they step back into the synagogue. Yeah. They will be required to stand up and say, no, nope, not following Jesus anymore. No, Jesus is not the Messiah. They will be required to confess something different. And here the exhortation is, hold fast your confession. Hold fast your confession. How do they hold it fast? Well, he's telling them about a great high priest. This is the first time this word great has been used of the high priest. Aaron in the old covenant was a high priest. But now this term great high priest is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. How is he a great high priest? You know that the role of the priest was to stand between God and man, an intermediary. And Jesus does that. He tells us in this section how he's a great high priest. The first thing is he has passed through the heavens. He's passed through the heavens. The heavens. That means that uh, he's reflecting upon the old covenant and how Aaron and the priesthood, they ministered on earth. They ministered in copies of the heavenly thing. Jesus, when the Lord told Moses, to, to, when he, he gave him the plans for the tabernacle, get it exactly right. Why? Because in some way this is a model of what's going on in heaven. Make sure you get it exactly right. And Aaron and his sons, they ministered in the earthly tabernacle. But it was just a copy. It was still only a copy. Jesus is a great high priest. He doesn't minister in a copy. He ministers in the real thing. He goes right into the very presence of the Father. Aaron sheds blood on an altar and sprinkles it on a copy. Jesus has taken his blood right before the Father in the throne room of heaven. And the Father says, I am satisfied. He was never satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats. Never. But when his son stood before him at his ascension, the father said, I am satisfied. And when you stand in Jesus, the father looks over you and he says, I am satisfied. There's nothing more to do for this one. My son has done it all. You stand completely in this morning. 
That's your rest, folks. Yeah. That's the Sabbath rest. <laughs> Don't let the enemy snatch it from you. You've got a great high priest because he ministers in the reality, not in the copy. He's a great high priest because not only has he gone through the heavens, but he is the son of God. Back there in, in chapter uh, 2, we found that the high priest has come from the brothers. He's a human being. So at one level, this high priest is both a human, is a, is, he represents us from humanity, but he is a great high priest because he's also God. And where humanity fails, we're going to find that out in chapter 5, where the human high priests fail, this high priest does not fail. He represents us perfectly as God and as man, and he has not failed. He's a great high priest. You can trust him. Now, I was thinking, as I was thinking about the degree to which we can trust him, I don't know, if, have you ever done those things on the high wires, where you're hooked in and harnessed and you walk around? There's all up in the Lake, Lake District in Grisdale Forest and Ledger, they call it Go Ape, for some reason. And uh, you're hooked on, you go on these cables, you climb up trees and you go across thin things and, and you're hooked on with two, a harness and you've got two cables with carabiners hooked on. And at no time we need to have both carabiners unhooked. You go around obstacles by unhooking one carabiner, putting it around the obstacle, hooking it back on, then unhooking the other. And you've got to be very careful to do that or else you might fall. Some of these things are 40, 50 feet up. I remember we went with a children's group from a church I was at up there. And the leader of the children's work, she was just so, she was loud. She was great. But she was one of these people that had all the, too much energy, too much energy. <laughs> and when I saw the top, she was, at the top of the tree, she was a, a ghostly white. And she was silent. Thank you, Jesus! <laughs> it made me chuckle. Well, the first thing the first thing you do is you get a little trial on to make sure you can hook off and hook on properly. And there's a little section you walk along. You know what I did? I hooked on these two things, and I was walking along this thing like this. I thought, you know what? I'm never going to be at peace here unless I test the security rope. So you know what I did? I just jumped off, and the rope held. The rope held. You know what? Going eight was nothing for me because I wasn't scared because I knew that I had a security Amen. that was bigger than my weight. And that's a big thing. <laughs> we have Jesus who has gone through the heavens. He represents us perfectly. Have you tested the weight of his strength? Are you secure and sure in his ability to hold you in everything? Right, good. Hold fast to your confession. Because yeah. he's able to keep you. He's a perfect high priest. He's a great high priest. He goes on to tell us more about uh, this, this one. He's tested in every way and yet without sin. And uh, he's been tested as we are. So he say, Lord, you don't know what it's like. He does. And yet he's not failed. You know, it's great to have someone who knows what they're doing. He's not just tried it and failed, he's tried it and succeeded. So where we are weak, he can step in and say, my child, I've been tested of you and this is the way to do it so that you win. This is the way to do it so that you succeed. And so he's able to sympathize with us. And there's another letter here, it's let us draw near with confidence. We're going to draw near to, it's the throne of grace that we're drawing near to. Isn't that awesome? Again, thinking about what they were facing. Emperor Nero, on his throne in Rome, makes an edict. And Christianity is outlawed. Was Emperor Nero's throne a throne of grace? I don't think so. The throne on the world was a throne of smallness, a throne of bitterness, a throne of pride, a throne of fearfulness, a throne of, of punishment, a throne of earthly power. It's nothing compared with the throne in heaven. Amen. The throne in heaven isn't capricious, isn't judgmental. The throne in heaven is a throne of grace. Yeah. It's a throne of grace. God's total undeserved favor falling upon your life, falling upon my life. Why would we not enter such a throne room? But it's the throne that we're entering. Anybody remember Tommy Tenney's book, The God Chasers? How many of us have read God, Tommy? It's a good book. We've been out a long while now. Tommy Tenney was a revivalist preacher, still is, I think. But he tells the story, and you'll have heard this no doubt, of how the high priest in the Old Covenant can only go into the most holy place once a year. And uh, he says they will tie a rope around the leg of the high priest. So that if something happened to him, if he went in in an unworthy manner, and God said, no, you're not worthy, and took his life, 
The others wouldn't have to go in to pull him out because God might think the same of them and finish them off as well. So they put a rope around his leg so that if something happened, they could pull him out without having to go in. That makes sense to me. I like that thinking. But that's how fearful they were of going into the most holy place. And the writer to the Hebrews says, we have confidence to enter into the throne of grace. You know that when you step into his presence, he's never going to say, no, there's something in your life, you're dead. Never. Never, 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 never. When you step into his presence, it's grace. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. grace. Yeah. Because of Jesus. Yeah. Every time, because of Jesus. They have been tempted to give up on that. Why? Don't give up on it. Enter into, with boldness, the throne of grace. There you receive mercy and find grace. As we read that, sometimes the emphasis might fall on mercy, but I think the emphasis falls on receive, find, help in time of need. Here you get everything that you need. And I know sometimes things get difficult. Sometimes we wonder where God is in it all. And in those times, we say, God, you know what? (laughs) What are you doing? And... We begin to cut ourselves off from in quiet times, fall by the way, thinking, God, I'm not happy with you at the moment. I don't feel like getting into your presence. I don't feel like communing with you, worshipping with you. And we can let go of the very thing that will give us help in the time of need. That's why he says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Step into his presence. I wonder if some of us are a bit like that this morning. Where we're questioning and wondering about God. There are things for us to do to receive the help of God. I'm reminded, and I'm not going to be long now, I'm conscious of time, of, uh, of Matthew 11 and that passage we all love. Uh, Come unto me, all you who labour are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we love the sense of ministry, the sense of healing, the sense of comfort and ease that those words bring. But we've got to know what Jesus says. Come, come. You've got to come. And just take, take my yoke upon you. You've got to take his yoke. The thing about a yoke was, it was something that joined two, two animals together. And if you were going to be joined to Christ, you've got to take off your own yoke. You've got to take off what you were joined to in order to be yoked with him. Take my yoke. He won't force it. You've got to choose it. And then he says, learn. I mention that because so often the help of God is there, but we've got something to do to access it. Yeah. We've got to come. We've got to take. We've got to learn. Here it says, we have got to enter into his presence. Let us draw near. Some of us feeling a little bit distant from the Lord. Some of us feeling like, oh, what are you doing? And allow that to separate us a little. And this morning, his word to us is, don't stay that way. Don't harden your hearts. Draw near. Think of Jonah, you know. Poor old Jonah. He had to, he was down in the bottom of the sea in the belly of a fish before he began to cry out to God, help. Don't let it get that far. Don't have to become a piece of whale puke (laughs) before you cry out to God. Right now, right today, you turn and say, Father, you know what? You know, the enemy loves to create a sense of distance between you and your father. Let me tell you, there is no distance. It's only what the enemy's created. Yeah, that's right. It's only what the enemy's created. When you take a step back to him, he's right there. He's always there. He's never left. Enter his presence. You'll find him there right for you. So we've got in this morning's world, we've got this strong challenge. Although it's a powerful word. God's going to hold it to count because he, when he speaks, stuff happens. If he's speaking into your life, he's looking for stuff to happen. It's a powerful word. Open your heart and say, yes, Lord, this morning, Lord Jesus, I receive your word as a powerful word. Lord, I repent, cleanse me from the, from the way I've squashed it, quashed it, poured cold water on it but this morning. And I don't understand it, but by faith I receive the word of creation into my heart again. Because it's the, the double-edged sword of the word of God. More powerful than any force in the world. More powerful than Neo and the Empire. More powerful than anything. The word of God. Lord, I'm going to respect your word. I'm going to cling on to you. And as we choose that, he says, come into my presence. I'm secure. Hold fast to your confession. And draw near with confidence that you might find help 
in your time of need. He's there for you in your time of need. Amen? Amen. Wow, what a letter, what a book, what a challenge. But God is equal to it all and he provides for us all. Hallelujah. Thanks, man. Bless you. Amen. There's a dance that's in your chair. You've given us the bed. Now we're stirring up ahead.